Hi, welcome once again on my scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. Uh, once again, a short introduction below that window with me in it, you can see uh, the letters discoversocialsciences.com. Uh, it is because each video that I publish on my channel is paired with a written update on my scientific blog, on the blog entitled Discover Social Sciences. So, you go into the description box below the video. In the description box, you find this link, discoversocialsciences.com. You click on the link and the link takes you to the website of my blog, Discover Social Sciences. And on that website, on, on the site of my blog, you can find a written update which has the same title as this video. So this is how that content is being paired together. So now I go into the subject matter of this update. I am placing this update essentially because I am, I am puzzled by some data that I have treated and uh, made the computation on the grounds of. I entitled this video The Puzzle of Urban Density because there are some puzzling facts about what I define as urban density or to be more specific about the density of urban population. First of all, I, for those who haven't uh, followed so far my recent updates on the topic, I will just quickly restate or reframe uh, like the theory, the big theory behind the research that, that I am now doing. So I am pursuing a hypothesis of mine that technological change that has been going on in our civilization at least since, since 1960 is oriented on increasing urbanization on, on, uh, of humanity and more specifically on effective rigid partition between urban areas and rural ones. I developed on that specific hypothesis in my earlier updates. I will not uh, repeat myself now so as not to, to, to bore my viewers. Uh, and uh, against that general background, against that general hypothesis, I have sort of a more specific one. I assume or I hypothesize that Cities are a good environment to create new social roles for new people coming with the demographic growth. This is why I chose this background made of two, two graphics. Uh, the graph, which is on, uh, sorry, on my right. This is my right and it is pr probably your left. So this graph here shows uh, the, the pace of demographic growth. Uh, shown as the time in years uh, needed to increment world population by one additional billion. On this graph we go like all the way from, from the, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, it is the long grey bar, down to that short bar that we have essentially now, the bar 13. Uh, so 13 years are needed to add another billion, another billion to, uh, to humanity. Uh, and against that background of demographic growth, I assume that each new person coming like to, the, to social life with the demographic growth needs a social role. And uh, I follow that thread of research that cities are specific social structures, those demographic anomalies, as uh, Fernand Brodel stated it. By the way, I will, for one moment, I will return to, uh, to the title page slide. Here, I quoted this, uh, uh, this phrase from a French historian, Fernand Brodel, that the town is a demographic anomaly. So in this, in this video, in this, up, uh, in, my, in, in this update on my scientific blog, I'm very much following that intuition that the town, the city, is truly a demographic anomaly. So I return to my statement or to my connection about cities and social roles. My intuition is the greater the density of population in cities, the more social roles can be created. This is why I showed on my left, 
that graphical scheme of a social role, of what a social role is. The social role is essentially made of connections with other people. And uh, I assume that somehow the denser the population that we live in, the more connection each of us can create with other people because of that greater density and the more different social roles we can define in this manner. Uh, in this update I am going uh, very mathematical. Uh, I am focusing on a specific metric, the density of urban population. In this slide I am just explaining to those of you who might get lost in the way those co coefficients are calculated, especially then le that later on in the same presentation I build like a compound co coefficient, like two densities one on the top of the other. So urban density or, dan or density of urban population is defined as the head count of urban population divided by the urban land area. So it is like people per square kilometer or people per square mile. Once again, my intuition accompanying this specific coefficient of density is that the more different social roles are there in cities, the more technology is used in urban space. Uh, so, as for calculating uh, that coefficient of urban den density, there are essentially two methods of calculating uh, the, the area of urban land. So, there are two ways of calculating how many square kilometers or square miles we have in cities. There is the administrative method and the physical cartographic method. Uh, the administrative method is essentially used by national statistical institutions and it goes like from the legal to the geographical. So first of all, we define administratively, we define by the force of law, the borders of cities. And then we simply measure the extent of territory comprised inside the borders of cities. That's one method. Another one, uh, the one that is uh, that produces the data available with the World Bank and uh, which is originally applied and which, as far as I know, has been created by scientists from the Columbia University, is the cartographic physical method and it is based on satellite imagery. Essentially, uh, those scientists at Columbia University, they measure the density of human structures, of human-made buildings and infrastructural objects like roads and railroads. So they measure the density of those structures as observable in satellite photos. And then they measure the density of nighttime lights also visible on satellite photos, but on satellite photos taken uh, during the night. And those two types of data, so observable density of architectural structures and observable density of nighttime lights, produce uh, a categorization, urban or rural, uh, uh, where that density of architectural structures and nighttime lights combined is greater than a, th a, th a certain threshold value, then we have a city or a town. When it is below the threshold, it is rural or it is not a city. And here comes my first puzzlement because I compared the data supplied by Columbia University as for the expanse of urban land, according to their measurements, with the data supplied by national statistical institutions. And I did it for uh, four countries. My native Poland, at the very, at the very base of the, uh, of, of, of the graph, for the United Kingdom, from France and for United States. The green bars on the graph show the, the area of urban land defined according to the Columbia University method. So according to that method based on satellite e imagery. 
the red bars uh, correspond to the total surface of urban land as measured administratively by national statistical institutions in those countries. And as you can see, there is a large discrepancy. In the United States, it is huge. Uh, in Poland, uh, essentially two. In um, everywhere across the world, every country I could check uh, displays a difference. Usually, although not always, usually that the difference is uh, uh, has the same nature. So the the area of urban land as defined cartographically on the base of satellite pictures is greater than the administratively defined area of cities. There are exceptions, such as France. Uh, but generally what we have in terms of measurements of cities is that uh, what is visible from the orbit, from the satellite pictures, is different from what is administratively recognized as cities. Apparently, we have some urban space which is administratively rural. It is administratively countryside, but it has an urban character. So just now to explain what is going to go to happen further. I calculate uh, those coefficients of density in urban population so urban population divided by the area of urban land, I calculate that coefficient for each country separately on the grounds of the Columbia University data as for the expanse of urban land. So I assume that what is true is essentially what comes out from the satellite observation and not necessarily from administrative assumptions. And I use it also because it, this coefficient of urban density based on the Columbia University method of measurement of our urban land, it shows really strange correlations with other socioeconomic variables. Essentially, those correlations are so strong and so puzzling that I am still wrapping my mind around them. I will give you a glimpse of, of that in the slides that come after this one. But it is really strange, really interesting. Uh, so first of all, uh, I will sh make or I will show you the way I make another coefficient out of those co coefficients. So I, by myself, I calculate the du, this one, the du, or the density of urban population according to, to the methodology I have just discussed. Now, straightforwardly or straight from the database of the World Bank, I can get this DG or the density of general population in each country separately and in the world in general. And I told to myself that if I make a compound coefficient, like a compound fraction, density of urban population divided by the general density of population, it is like an arithmetical measure of difference, of sociological difference between the city and the countryside. So the greater the value of that fraction, so the, the greater the, let's say, or the more the density of urban population is above the general density of population, so the greater the discrepancy between those two, the greater is the difference in the given country between the city and the countryside. Now in this slide, I am just developing it, uh, this fraction so as to make, uh, to make you understand how it goes uh, arithmetically. So we start with the density of urban population divided by general density of population, which, as I said, is a fraction made of two fractions. In the denominator, we have the fraction urban population divided by urban land area. And in the denominator, we have that fraction general population divided by the general land area. Now, after a transitional transformation, uh, I can transform that into this urban population divided by urban land area times 
the reverse of that denominating frac uh, fraction, so times the general land area divided by general po population. It is that principle that you pr probably remember from school, that if we divide one fraction by another fraction, it is as if we were multiplying that first fraction by the reverse of the second fraction. And it all boils down to, the, to the, that, that this du dg coefficient can be interpreted as the ratio of urban population divided by general population, so the ratio of urbanization, multiplied by the reverse uh, or by the reverted ratio of uh, geographical ur urbanization, so by the ratio gen general land area divided by urban land area. So this is the, well, what I have just shown you is that fraction du divided by dg, that du divided by dg is the, let's say, the metaphorical distance or the metaphorical difference between the city and the countryside in social terms, in terms of density. And here is that like the, the fact that literally blew me away. I still don't know how to interpret it. Here you have uh, categories of countries plus United States as, uh, uh, as a separate uh, category. Categories of countries as defined by the World Bank and for each category, you have that compound coefficient, density of urban population denominated in units of general density of population. So the poorest countries, fragile and conflict affected situations, heavily indebted poor countries, low income countries, they all display a huge value of that compound coefficient. So in other words, in poor countries, like in really poor countries, the difference, the social difference between the city and the countryside is apparently stunning. It is huge. It is like two different worlds. As we go up the ladder of income, that ratio or that difference uh, between the city and the countryside is diminishing. Here you have upper middle income, 26 low and middle income, 22, and so we go down the scale through United States, and here is the European Union, so where I live, 565. So you could say that in European Union, the difference between the city and the countryside, the social difference between the city and the countryside, is like 18 times smaller than the same difference in those fragile and conflict-affected countries. I am still thinking about it. I don't know what exactly it means. And yet, there is that clear connection. The wealthier the country, the wealthier the continent, the wealthier the region, and the more stable po politically the place, uh, the smaller is the social difference between the city and the countryside. So the smaller is the capacity or the smaller is the difference between the city and the countryside as regards the capacity to generate new social roles. Still thinking about it, still trying to formulate some conclusions about it. And here comes something even more puzzling, something that I don't even uh, try to explain like step by step. It is shown in the next graph, in the last graph of that presentation. Here we have a really compound graph. So uh, the categories in that graph are the categories of DU, DG. So the categories of that, uh, of that uh, coefficient that I made uh, density of urban population divided by the density of general population. So, so these categories here, these are, uh, these, are, you know, these are essentially intervals, so the so-called sextiles, because they divide my total set of countries and regions into six, uh, into six subsets. Those intervals are essentially the intervals of relative difference, of relative social difference between the city and the countryside. The red bars on the graph 
show the average consumption of energy per year per person measured in kilograms of oil equivalent. Just for your information, one kilogram of oil equivalent is equivalent to approximately 11.63 kilowatt hours in terms of general energy consumptions. And uh, the black line here is the line that connects the points which show another variable, the coefficient of patent applications per 1 million people. That's the coefficient that I discussed more exhaustively in my last update. It is the so-called intensity of patenting. You can assume that the more patent applications we have, per, we have per 1 million people, the greater the intensity of patenting, so the greater the speed of emergence in marketable science. It is very much a metric of the pace of technological change. And so we have two metrics. And first of all, something really puzzling. As the difference between the city and the countryside decreases. So as we go down the scale of that du divided by dg co coefficient, the consumption of energy per capita grows. And I really don't know why. One explanation here in that category, in, the, in that category of the greatest uh, discrepancy or the greatest social difference between the city and the countryside, we have countries like Greenland, Mauritania, Somalia, Australia, so countries with really adverse natural conditions. But save for this little anomaly, as we go down the scale of that social difference between the city and the countryside, we go up the scale of energy consumption per capita. I still don't know why, I just... I am just uh, thinking about the possible reason. And as we go to the patent applications per million people, we have two peaks on that scale, here and here. And now another thing. According to my calculations, around 71% of all humans on the planet, around so uh, uh, a little bit more than 5 billion people, live in this category, in this category of uh, difference between the urban density and the general density of population in this category of energy consumption and this category of intensity in patenting. Uh, this is uh, one of those graphs which do not really give answers, they just ask questions and this graph sort of asks many questions at once. I am st still trying to understand what is its real meaning, yet it is one of those puzzling things that I just like sharing. So that will be it in this update. Once again, if you want to read the written counterpart of this specific update on my scientific blog, you go to the description box below the video, you click on the link discoversocialsciences.com uh, the link takes you to my website, to the, uh, to the site of my scientific blog, and there you can find a written update, which has the same title as this video. Okay, bye to all and have fun with the science.